Just before I uh, bring the word of God to you, uh, how good is Fiona Wang, huh? Amazing. She is so gifted. She is so talented, that girl. Um, there was a photo, there was a picture of um, um, some, some, some nice panoramic shot. Uh, it's got the welcome sign. This is the one. Look at that. How beautiful was that? That is um, the work of Phil Strubinger. Our Phil, who his lovely wife traveling, I think, in, they're currently right now in, in I think, in, in South America, in South Africa, I think. And I'm not quite sure where this is. Does anyone know where this is? It's in Norway, Norway. And he sent that through during the week, and he said, look, if you could put that on the screen, let everyone know that we're doing well, we're traveling well, and, and we'll be back. Uh, I think they're back in early Feb. So they'll be here for two weeks, and they'll share with us what they're doing and where they're going. So please uh, keep them in your prayers. We know that Phil and Irene, uh, they believe that God has called them uh, into long-term mission. And they're heading off, I think, somewhere in China, um, end of this year or early next year, to spend a good length of time in China. We're talking five, ten years over there. And that's really great that we have Sun Lifers hearing what God is saying and following God. Anyhow, we start the series topic. As Claire said, preach your favorite Bible passage. And it's very hard for me as a preacher because I do this every week and I've got so many great passages. So I, I, I was praying to God. I said, God, what, what should I preach from? So this is one, one of my favorites. Okay? One of my favorites. It's in the Old Testament. The book of Numbers. All right? That's where we are. Numbers chapter 21 verses 4 to 9. All right, so if you have your Bible, please go to Numbers. It's on the screen. It's okay. I'm going to pray, and we'll read the Word of God together, and I'll start unpacking that with you. Let me pray. Uh, Father God, help me now as I uh, do my best to unpack this wonderful passage to your people. I ask you, help me, Lord, to speak with clarity, with, with passion, Lord, with authority. And Lord, may we all take something home this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, it's on the screen behind you. Numbers. Chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. Let me read, and let's learn this together. Here we go. From Mount Hall, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Verse 6, Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents, or snakes, among the people. Tss, sound effects there. And they bit the people, and so many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the snakes, the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. So what's going on there? They're impatient. They complain. God sends these poisonous snakes. Some are bitten. Some tragically die. They come to Moses and say, look, we've sinned against the Lord. Please pray so God will take these snakes away from us. Verse 8. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live and we stop right there it's an interesting passage you know we can read that and say well does it mean that if I do something bad God is going to send me some zombie like cockroaches and eat me up you know and, and people come up with this theology that well well God is this angry God who sends out serpents to bite you so you better not complain about the food that you have we've got to read this in light of the New Testament we have to read this and think about Jesus Christ. Because the whole Bible, I've said this to you before, the whole Bible points to Christ. 
All right, so we have to read it with the lens of the New Testament. So there are three things that I have learned from this, and I want you to consider. Here they are. A discouraged spirit leads to a complaining heart. Our mediator, Jesus Christ, is much greater than Moses. And God does not take away our problem. He gives us a solution. There are the three things that as I studied the scripture during the week that God really spoke to me, that a discouraged spirit leads to a complaining heart. Our mediator, Jesus Christ, is much greater than Moses. And God does not take away our problem. He gives us a solution. Let me unpack that with you. Look in verses 4 and 5 again. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. Let me explain what's going on here. Can you remember how many years the people were walking in the desert, wandering in the wilderness? Can you remember how many years? Shout out. 40 years. That's a long time. Could you imagine that there would have been children born in the desert and all they would have known is walking yeah the setting here in numbers 21 is at probably year 38 or 39 so they've been going about this for 38 39 years and right now they've got to head back to the red sea you know where the red sea was the red sea was the very first point that they had to cross. Remember when the Egyptians were chasing after them and they saw the Red Sea and Moses parted the Red Sea some 38, 39 years ago? So where are they heading back now? Towards the Red Sea. Can you see the frustration? Can you see the discouragement? And the reason why they have to go towards the Red Sea was because the king of Edom did not allow them to cross his territory. So the only way for them was to go back to the Red Sea and go around the land of Edom. Picture this. You've been walking around for 38, 39 years. You're born in the desert and all you know is this harsh, dry condition. And you've been walking and now you have to walk back to the place that you started off. This is crazy. And the Bible says that the people became what? Impatient on the way. It says it right there. And then verse 5, the people spoke against God, against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert, the wilderness? There is no food, there is no water, and we do not like the food that you give us. What is that food that God gave them? Manna. Remember when they left Egypt, a bit of history here, when they left Egypt, they were hungry. So they said, God, we're hungry. God says, okay, food, some form of bread came down. They rejoice. They had food. And then they said, well, we're thirsty. And God goes, go to the rocks and there'll be water coming out of the rocks. They rejoice. There's water. Right? And right here, what do they say? No food, no water. Obviously, there's lots of food, lots of water. And they say this horrible thing that why have you brought us out to die in the wilderness? Why? Why? And as you read the Bible, especially the book of Exodus, you see this pattern a lot. God does a, a miracle and they rejoice. Yeah! And then they complain. Why? <laughs> why did you do? Why did you take us out of Egypt? We should have been back in Egypt. And then God does another miracle. Yes, they rejoice. And then later on, why? If you have a chance, read Exodus 15. They sing this song of triumph, and in the very next chapter, they're complaining. That's the cycle of God's people. God does something, and we're like, yeah! And then later we go, God, I, I want you to do more. It's the same food every day. It's the same water every day. The same desert every day. And they forgot the joy of what God did. In fact, if you know your Bible, in Deuteronomy 29, 5, it's on the screen. This is amazing. During the 40 years that I led you through the desert, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. You know that? 40 years when they were walking, their sandals, I don't know what type of sandals they were wearing, but it didn't wear out. The clothes they had on, it didn't wear out. God was sustaining them, His, his providence, His protection. 
And they didn't see all these things. They didn't see it. They didn't realize that God was loving them so much. And the reason why they were impatient and the reason why they were discouraged was because the miraculous, listen carefully, the miraculous became the norm. And it was no longer extraordinary. Here's the first lesson for us. Listen carefully. A discouraged spirit leads to a complaining heart. We cannot be Christians. Listen carefully, Sun Life Church. We cannot be Christians living on hype. You attend one Christian conference after the next Christian conference, and then the next Christian conference. Oh, you hear there's a great prophet in town, a great preacher in town, a great teacher in town. Everyone's raving about this person. So you want to go there and listen to them because you don't want to miss out what God is doing over there. And you live after this hype. If we are dependent upon the supernatural, right? Supernatural upon supernatural, we forget the greatest miracle that God sent His Son to die for us on the cross. And we become people who forget what God is actually doing behind the scene. You see, the people here in the book of Numbers, they forgot that God saved them when they were crying out in Egypt. May we never fall into the trap of forgetting how God saved us when He sent His Son to go to that cross. You see, the people in Numbers here, they, they forgot the constant blessing of manna, water, clothes, and sandals that never wore out. May we never fall into the trap of forgetting God sustaining us with nature, oxygen, the food that we have, the shelter, the beautiful weather in Perth. May we never forget that. Because if we're not careful, what once started as a thankful heart becomes a complaining heart. Because we're expecting God to do greater things more and more and more. There's a story of a, of a lady named Carol. She decided to, to bake an apple pie for Mrs. Smith, who lived on the same street. So she baked this nice apple pie, and she went to Mrs. Smith's house, and she pressed the door, and Mrs. Smith opened, and to her surprise, there's Carol there holding a nice apple pie. And Mrs. Smith would reply, For me? Oh, thank you so much. You just don't know how much I love apple pie. You're so thoughtful. Thank you, thank you, Carol. Wow, Carol walked over. And because Carol knew that Mrs. Smith loved the pie, the following week, Carol baked another apple pie and went to Mrs. Smith's house. And she opened the door and she said, Thank you so much. You're so kind, Carol. And Carol said, Okay, I'll bake another pie the following week. And she popped over to Mrs. Smith's house and she opened the door and this time her reply was simply, thanks. And then Carol took another pie the following week and this time Mrs. Smith's reply was, you're a day late with this pie. The following week Carol took over another pie and Mrs. Smith now said, try to use a bit more sugar and don't bake it too long because I've noticed the crust has been quite hard and you know what? I actually like cherry, not apple. So the next time when you give me a cake, give me cherry. The following week, Carol was so busy, she didn't get a chance to bake any cake. And as she was walking past Mrs. Smith's house on the way to the store, Mrs. Smith noticed that Carol walked by and she wasn't carrying any cake. So she stuck her head out the door and shouted, Where's my pie? You see... If we're not careful, what starts off as a thankful heart becomes one that is demanding. And I want this and I want God to do that. And when He doesn't do it the way I want it, it becomes a complaining heart. Because we get discouraged. Because we feel that God is not being the God that we want Him to be. And we have to learn to be thankful of the small things and the big things. Are you with me? I mean... Let's be honest here. It's easier to be thankful of the big things. You land a great job. Praise God. You find a beautiful Christian partner. Praise God. You score some cheap tickets, flight to New York. Yeah. Praise God. Your AFL team wins the AFL grand final. Yeah. Praise God. But the Bible clearly says we've got to thank God for everything. Give me some verses right here. Ephesians 5.20. Giving thanks always 
always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thessalonians, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Everything. The big things and the small things. And you know how I harp on a lot that how we're such a great church, and I really mean that, that we're such a unified church and we're such a loving community? I think one of the other reasons why that's the case is because a lot of us here, we have thankful hearts and not complaining hearts. Remember when we studied James last year, in James chapter 4, the reason why the church started fights and quarreling was because the things that they wanted, they didn't get. So there was this frustration from within, right? And they got really bitter and they had a lot of fights. And the beauty about this church here, and I want us to keep this, is that a lot of us here, we have thankful hearts. We're encouraged with what God is doing. Let's not be a church where we're complaining over the little things. Oh, the music is too loud. The pastor shouts all the time. The room is a bit too dark. The room is not cold enough. The kids' program is not as good as the other church. Let's not be like that. Because if we get caught up with a discouraged spirit, it will lead to a complaining heart. And maybe, maybe this morning you're discouraged. Maybe this morning uh, expectations are not met. You're feeling that God doesn't love you. Maybe your marriage is not going to plan. Maybe, you, maybe your career is not where it should be. Can you please find time to be encouraged with what God has already done for you? He saved you. He promised to never leave you. He promised to come back for you. He died for you so that you do have to die that eternal death. He's given you this community called Sun Life Church, a community who promised to stand beside you through the thick and thin. Let's encourage each other. Let's continue to remind each other of the goodness of God in the little things and the big things so that the Spirit is always encouraged and never discouraged. Because when it's discouraged, the heart becomes one that's complaining. That's point one. Let's carry on. Verses six and seven. Then the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Let me explain what's going on here. It's quite simple. They complain. They're not grateful. God sent poisonous snakes with one purpose to bite them. Simple. God did not send toy, soft toy snakes so they can cuddle. No. He sent poisonous snakes to bite them as a form of judgment. And we notice in the text, sadly, some of the Israelites died. Then they came to Moses and said, Moses, we need your help. We need you to be our mediator. We need you to pray to God so that he would change the course of judgment. We have sinned. We've, sp we've, sp we've spoken against the Lord. We need you to do something, Moses. Can you pray on our behalf? Can you stand between us and God? We're too scared to go near God. Can you do it? Can you be our mediator? And the second lesson for us, listen carefully, is that we today, as Christians today, our mediator, Jesus, is much greater than Moses. Much greater. Let me explain you what mediation is all about. Many years ago, uh, I had this dispute with a neighbor regarding a dividing fence. Okay, long story short, uh, we had to go to mediation. Long story short. I wish I knew Jack there. Jack, you would have come with me, Jack, and we would have won that, right? Anyhow, we went to mediation, and the mediator's job was simply to allow both parties to speak in a civil manner. And I remember one, one, one occasion, he invited one of the parties to leave the room and the other would remain and he would give them some advice and then vice versa. And after this, the, the, I think it was a three or four hour session, right, the mediator's job was to bring some form of uh, a resolution. And the great thing about this mediator, I noticed, was that he was never biased. His job wasn't to say, well, you're wrong, you're right. His job was just to mediate, to allow the parties to speak. All right? His job was simply to attempt to influence this disagreement between myself and my neighbor, right? so that the goal would be one that is, you know, hopefully a, a, a great result. 
The Bible teaches us that we have a mediator. His name is Jesus Christ. But I reckon this mediator is wonderful because he's very biased towards us. Look at Hebrews 9, 15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. That those who are called, that you and I, may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Let me explain what's going on there. You see, with Moses, when he was called to be a mediator, this is important to understand this, Moses wasn't quite sure what the outcome would have been. Because Moses is a man. He would come and he would pray and hopefully God would change what he did with sending those poison snakes. There would have been some doubts because Moses wasn't quite sure what God would have done. You see, with Jesus, he's God. He's perfect. He's confident on the work on the cross. He's confident that he has done all the work so that we're accepted by the Father. He's biased because he's with us. He's for us. He's on our side. He's not a mediator who comes to God and says, God, uh, uh, you do your part. The sinful people, you do your part. And hopefully you guys will come to a nice, happy resolution. No. Jesus comes into the situation and realizes that there's nothing wrong with God. There's everything wrong with you and I. We're in trouble. We're hopeless. We're useless. There's nothing good about us. There's nothing that we can do to change the course of God's judgment. Jesus comes into the scene and realizes, well, there's nothing that these sinful people can do. They can't give a bit because they've got nothing to give. God, He's done nothing wrong. So why should He bend backwards? So He comes on our behalf to do everything for us everything he comes to defend us he comes to stand up for us he comes to say to the father that these people here i represent them and my good works what i did on the cross is for them and since i did it all they're with me they're found in me i, I had a, a a Krispy Kreme donut with my my sons when we were down south and they, they placed it in this little paper bag and they carefully put the Krispy Kreme donut into the paper bag and they, they fold it up and they give it to you. What happens if I was to grab that bag with the donut inside and crush it, crush the bag? What happens to the donut? The donut will also be crushed. Is that right? Right. And what Jesus does, it says, all these people, they're in me. I have been crushed, so have they. I've died, so have they. I've resurrected, so have they. I'm perfect, so are they. He's biased because he did everything for us. That's the good thing about God. Everything God did for you and I. If you understand that, that you can't help it but worship God. You can't help it but sing to Jesus. If you realize that when you and God, when you're facing each other, there's nothing you can do because you are the offender and Jesus would come along and He would clear it all Wow, you really, truly will worship Jesus for who He is. In fact, I was just down south just recently and on the way through Bunbury, I got caught speeding. I wasn't happy. I don't want to go into the details. My wife wasn't happy. It's not fair. I'm just going through Bunbury, right? And you know what it is. They're very sneaky, these police. Very sneaky. I, I kid you not. Like, Here's my, here's my time to rant. Let me tell you what happened, right? I'm coming out of Bunbury, and, and it's, it's all I see now is just a lot of trees. So you know, okay, we're leaving the town. You can go to 100 kilometers, 110. I'm still in an 80K zone. I get pulled over driving 95Ks or something. A big fine, double demerit. Ooh. Did you know? Did you know? 50 meters from where I got caught was the 110 sign. So they parked 50 meters. Jack, can we do something about Jack? Can we do something about this? Can we? <laughs> right, and, I, and I'm there, and, and he pulled me over. He did all the breathalyzer, which is fine. And I realized I'm at fault. I can't do anything. There's no excuse. There's no buts. There's no ifs. I'm, I'm caught. He goes, that's your speed. All right. Here's the speed limit, 80 gone and I just had to cop it on the chin and, and cry later on right and that's with us 
You know, when we stand before God, there is nothing God should do. God should not bend backwards. Don't think, right? Don't you ever think that you can get your way out of it because you can't. You come to God and God realizes that you've sinned and there's nothing you can do. And your only Savior is Jesus, your mediator. He comes in and He defends you because He's biased. He's for you, not against you. He doesn't say, God, you know, you're a bit lenient. Sinners, you give and take. No. He comes to the scene and He realizes, Sun Life people, Christians, there's nothing good about you guys. You guys are sinners. You're in trouble. But I'm going to sort it out. I'm going to stand between the anger of God and you and take it all on my shoulders. If you understand that, then you really worship Jesus. Then your life is all about Jesus. You know, Martin Luther, Martin Luther, the, the great Martin Luther, says that the wonderful exchange is found in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in Him, that's Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. Luther calls this the wonderful exchange where Jesus said, I'm your mediator and all your sins, I'm going to absorb that. And my righteousness, the perfect life that I lived, I'm going to give it to you sinful people. So that now you're okay with God. That's the Christian faith. If you're not a Christian here and you're hearing about this, that is the Christian faith. Faith. That's the good news. There's nothing you could do to save yourself. Nothing. And you stand before God one day as judge. You either say, God, uh, I did all these things. Uh, I gave money when people knocked for the blind society. Uh, I gave money for the poor. I did all these things. Uh, can I come into your kingdom? Or you can say, God, I have a mediator. His name's Jesus, and I'm found in Him. I'm like that donut in that paper bag. He's covering me. He represents me. I hope you would do that. God, I'm found in Jesus. He's my mediator. God says, welcome, Lord. Finally, the third point, verses 8 to 9. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. And we stop there. Here's the last lesson for us. God doesn't take away our problem. God gives us a solution. The thing with us, humanly speaking, is every time there's a problem, our very first reaction is to remove the problem. You heard that saying, right? Don't clean out the cobweb, kill the spider. You know, we, we think there's a problem, there's a problem in my life, then what I've got to do is get rid of that problem. I remember my son Oliver once was bitten by something, an insect, maybe a spider or a mosquito, and Oliver has this, a bit of a reaction. Every time something bites him, he, he swells up a fair bit. And uh, I wasn't quite sure whether it was at home or at church or, or at school, but the loving father in me, mixed with a bit of psycho terminator, said, that's it. Bugs, you bite my son, I'm going to hunt you all down and kill all you and all your relatives, right? I kid you not. Like, like in the movie scenes where the last scene of the movie where the hero goes into the ammunition shop and he loads up with the rocket launcher and the grenade and everything. He walks out in slow motion, right? Ready to have the final fight. It was a bit like that walking out of Bunnings with Mortine and Raid, right? And I'm walking out Bunnings and I've got all, and I kid you not, I went home and I sprayed my whole house trying to kill everything. Anything that had six legs, you're gone. Sprayed top to bottom, right? That was my thinking. There's a problem. Eliminate the problem. The text doesn't say that. The people wanted Moses to pray so that God would remove the poison snakes. God did not remove the snakes. God kept the snakes there. Look at the text carefully. God goes, make another snake out of bronze. And put it on a pole. 
Anyone who's bitten, which means there still be snakes around, get them to look at that one snake and they'll live. How ridiculous was that? Can you imagine Moses saying, God, we're, we're, we're being attacked by all these poisonous snakes and, and all we want you to do is just get rid of them so that we can sleep well at night? I know that as a brother here, I know that one of my brother here is it's not very... Uh, Joseph, you okay with the sermon, Joseph? You're okay, right? Joseph's not a big snake fan, right? But is, is that obvious? There's a snake? Get rid of the snake, right? right? But God goes, no, I'm keeping the snakes there. Make another snake out of bronze, put on a pole. When you're bitten by a snake, just take the people there to look at the snake on the pole. <laughs> That's what God says. And I scratch my head and I think about this. And you know that the bronze snake was really anything. It could have been a wooden snake. It could have been a, a golden snake. It could have been a straw snake. That's not the point. The bronze snake on a pole was an exercise in faith and trust. Would you believe in God as healer? Because a snake made out of bronze cannot heal you. Are you with me? So don't think that you're bitten by a snake, you go look at a bronze snake. No. It was a form of exercise in their faith in trusting a God who is able to heal them. And that's the same with you and I. Maybe you're facing a problem right now. And you're praying, you're saying, God, God, can, can you take away that problem? God, can you remove that problem? And you've been praying for such a long time, and it seems like that problem is still there, and you begin to doubt the love of God. You begin to say, well, God, there's a problem, and I think that you should take that problem away because you love me. So your understanding of God is that if God loves me, He takes away my problem, but the problem is still there. So you think that God doesn't love you. You think God doesn't care. You think God is silent. But let me say He's never silent. He's doing something behind the scenes. Maybe, maybe it's time to stop thinking God in such a way like that. I've got a problem, I rub my genie, and God should come out and take my problem away. When that happens, yeah, I love God, God loves me, I praise God. And a lot of Christians, we think God in such a way like that. God, I, I need to find a, a career. God, can you give me a career? God, I've got this illness. Can you take that away? And every time God does the miracle and God does take the problem away, we praise Him. But when He doesn't, we don't praise Him. Because really, what is He? He's our little slave. Come out when I need you. Leave me alone when things are going fine. I don't need to hear from you, God, because things are good right now. But when it's a bit rocky, I'll rub the bottle and I want you to come out and play. Sometimes God loves you too much that He won't do that. He will still leave the problem there, but He gives you a solution. That's Himself. You heard that saying before, don't tell God how big your problem is, but tell your problem how big God is. Because God is your solution. Maybe God is saying, I leave that problem there so that you learn to keep trusting me more. Maybe God is waking you up and saying, don't you know that I am your solution? You still got that sickness, you still got that problem in you, but don't forget you have me. I'm your God. I'm your solution. Don't forget that I'm still there for you. Why don't you come and trust me and talk to me and have faith in me. Let me comfort you, even in the midst of suffering. Maybe God is more concerned with you trusting Him and depending upon Him than you hoping that He take away your problem. Could that be how God operates? Do you remember the wonderful passage in Romans 8 that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him. All things. Which means in bad things and good things. God is still behind the scene working out good for all those who love Him. So don't you ever dare say that if it doesn't work out good for me, God is bad. No. Even if I die, that's game. God is good. That's the type of Christian that I want to see in this church here. That we say, God... I still have this problem. That's okay. But I know that I have you. You're my solution. 
and you're far better than the problems that I face. And the greatest problem, listen carefully, the greatest problem is the problem of sin. The problem of sin is the greatest problem. And the wonderful thing about this passage here is if you read in John chapter 3, this is what Jesus says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. Jesus picks up Numbers 21 and says, Well, when Moses made that bronze snake and placed it on the pole, that people would look at it and live, I am the true bronze snake. That when I'm lifted on that cross and you look at me and you trust in me, you too will live. Do you have that life? that God has reserved for you? Do you know that He was lifted on that cross for you? Do you know that your greatest problem is the problem of sin? There's nothing that you can do to get rid of those sins. Don't you ever think that your good works would ever eliminate those sins because your good works are like rags to God. They're nothing. And the only thing that you have to do is look at that cross and say, Wow! I trust that Jesus died for me. I trust that all my sins were on Jesus. And for some of us, I'm I'm thinking, some of those people back in Numbers 21, they would have thought, that's crazy. That's ridiculous. Are you telling me that if I'm bitten by a poison snake, I look at a bronze snake on a pole and I will live? You've got to be kidding. And maybe they're Christians or people today who are still thinking like that. Wait, you're telling me that my sins are forgiven if I look at the cross and some Jesus died for me on the cross? You've got to be kidding me. That's ludicrous. But that's how it is. That's how God decides to do it. That is faith in Him. 1 Corinthians 1, let me read this for you. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know Him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. You see that? The foolishness, right, of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demanded signs and Greeks looked for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. See what Paul is saying there? What may seem foolish to people, we keep preaching that. Christ crucified. He died on the cross for your sin. You look at the cross and you trust that your sins are with Him. That's faith. That's it. And for a lot of people, like, that's foolish. That can't be right. It's got to be harder than that. For me to be a Christian, I've got to do all these things, don't I? Don't I have to go to church? Don't I have to pray seven times a week? Don't I have to give all my money away? Don't I have to do some volunteer stuff in the church? And then once I do all that, then I'm saved? No. Because that's all works. That's all works. All you have to do is believe that Jesus did it all for you. Is it foolish? Sounds foolish. But that's how God decides to save us. And that is the message that I will keep on preaching to the day God takes me home. With all my heart, I know that that foolish message saved me and it saved a lot of you guys. That that bronze snake that was raised so that people could look at it to be healed and live is fulfilled in Jesus Christ who was raised upon a cross So that all of us today, we look at that and believe that our sins are cleared. And I pray that you, Sun Life people, will continue to preach that foolish message to all the people around you. And even if they say, that's ridiculous, that can't be true, keep preaching that. And one of these days, may God soften their hardened hearts and may God draw them to Him. Amen? That's what He does with our sin. He doesn't take away it. He gives us a solution, which is Him. Him. Three things that I want you to remember from this first sermon from the series topic. Do you remember what they are again? A discouraged spirit leads to a complaining heart. 
be encouraged so that your heart is always thankful. Number two is that Jesus, our mediator, is much greater than Moses. He stands between us and God and he's biased, he's for us. And finally, whatever problem you may have, sometimes God, he may not take it away. But he gives himself as a solution. Amen. Let me pray with you. God, thank you so much for reminding us in uh, your wonderful word that you love us. You're always for us and never against us. And we love you for that. And thank you so much that we are people of the cross, people who love you because you took all our sins once and for all you. You forgave us. Thank you. Lord, we know that uh, you're so real. We know that you're so good. And we're thankful that we have Jesus. So Lord, I pray right now for those in this church, those who've been coming for some time, who may not know you, that maybe, Lord, uh, this year, 2016, be the year that they would have faith and trust in you. That they too would say, yes, I trust in Jesus. I need Jesus. Yes, he is my solution to my problem. So God, will you do the beautiful work in, in, in saving us, in drawing us? Lord, may you also give us confidence as Sun Lifers to really make this a wonderful year where we're boldly proclaiming the good news, that we're preaching what may seem foolish to the people around us. Lord, I pray, God, that we as a church will continue to work on our spirit, that may the spirit inside of us be encouraged every day. Lord, that we're thankful to you for the little things and the big things that you continually bless us Lord so God may we never ever have a demanding heart or a complaining heart but may our heart always be thankful thankful for what you did first when you died for us on that cross and God thank you so much that you're our mediator Jesus that you stand between us that you wrap us and you clothe us in your righteousness you took away our sins thank you so much God I pray that this church here, Sun Life Church, will just this year be a year where we will continue to lift you upon high. Continue to proclaim your goodness. Lord, may we always, always preach the gospel, the gospel that saves us first. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.